Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, where we discuss the films of John Carpenter from beginning to end, from Bronco Billy to the ward. My name is Alex. With me are my co-hosts, Julia. What up? And Noel. I really hope he gets at least one more after the ward. I hope so, too, but he seems to have a bright future as a pop star, so I'm not too worried. Yeah, can we do an entire episode just about the night music video? Probably. <laughs> I'm into it. <laughs> you do a mini episode, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's a great video. Bonus content. I was surprised to see he did not actually direct it, though. Yeah, I, it kind of makes sense, because it seems like such an homage to him, like it's kind of got that 80s sort of thing. For those of you listening, to tie into his new album of Lost Themes, he just did a music video for the track Night, where John Carpenter himself appears. That's true. And for a show that we're recording two months in advance, this is going to be incredibly topical two months from now. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. It's nice to see John still doing stuff. Absolutely. He looks good. He looks good. Julia, did you have a chance to see it? No. Okay. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> That's okay. I'm afraid to see his face. I still have yet to see it, and I don't want to. He's a nice mustache man. No. He's in Starman. No. Was he in Starman? I was looking for him. I figured he'd be a soldier. He's one of the helicopter pilots. Is all the helicopters flying at the end? Oh, uh, nice. yeah. I'm good. I must have just missed him. Because around the time he was doing the thing was when he learned how to fly a helicopter. Oh. And so now every time you need to see a helicopter pilot in one of his movies, it's probably going to be John Carpenter. Of course. That's where he always slips in his cameo, just so he has an excuse to show himself flying a helicopter. You gotta have a hobby. I got this, guys. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so yeah, today we are here to cover Starman. That's right, 1984, Starman. December 14th, 1984. Ooh, a Christmas release, Oscar bait. <laughs> Speaking of, this is the one and only film by John Carpenter to receive an Oscar nomination, and that's for actor Jeff Bridges. Yep, I actually did some research for that. Who took the prize from him? That's actually the one thing I didn't look up. Aha! <laughs> Let's just I assume. <laughs> I assume it was Ben Kingsley, <laughs> sir. <laughs> just assume yeah. it was Ben Kingsley, sir. <laughs> it was probably either Ben Kingsley or Meryl Streep. Who knows? That's true. Both Meryl took be best actor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, she could. I'm sure she's swept every acting category. I think so, and a few cinematographies. <laughs> <laughs> there was that one time she was a best boy grip. <laughs> So anyways, the budget was $22 million, which is, again, the largest budget he had ever worked with up to this time. Sadly, though, the domestic box office was only $28.7 million, so this film did officially bomb, despite being a critical darling and then becoming very successful on, on video and television. But yeah, this was kind of the nail in the coffin for John Carpenter as a big-budget studio director. Well, I want to say this is the second nail in the coffin, and the third nail in the coffin is going to be Big Trouble in Little China, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. This is the second of two films that Carpenter made for Columbia TriStar in the 80s, following Christine. He won't be doing another film with them again for over a decade, but he will be returning for Escape from L.A. and Ghosts of Mars. Huh. Aside from a cameo as a helicopter pilot, John only directed the film, as even the score is instead done by a man named Jack. I'm not sure if it's Nietzsche. Nietzsche. It's spelled exactly like the old philosopher. Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Okay. There's no one here to dispute it, so that's the way it is. Nietzsche. I'll, I'll go with it. Sounds good <laughs> yep. to me. Sounds legit. Jack, if you're listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> Whose other work as a composer include One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Blue Collar, Hardcore, Cruising, An Officer and a Gentleman, Breathless, Jewel of the Nile, Nine and a Half Weeks, Stand By Me, and Mermaids. And he also did the song Up Where We Belong. Huh. Let love lift you up where we belong. Don't stop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Take me right to the chorus. Go. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. That's like some 80s bona fides right there. The original screenplay from 1979 was written by Bruce A. Evans and Reynold Gideon, who also wrote A Man, A Woman, and a Bank, Stand By Me, Made in Heaven, Cutthroat Island, and Jungle to Jungle, as well as Cuffs and Mr. Brooks, both of which were also directed by Evans. That was a colorful wheelhouse. I was going to say, that's a lot of bombs as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Yes, and I am very much going to have things to say about their original draft of the script. (laughs) Then came in Dean Reisner, who stuck with the project for years as it went through dozens of rewrites under a string of directors. Despite his time with the project, he was denied a credit by the WGA because, you know, it's that whole thing where you can change a ton of it, but as long as the basic structure is still the same, they're not going to give you a credit. (laughs) <laughs> Reisner began as a child star in 1928, then started writing B-movies in the 40s and dozens of TV shows throughout the 50s and 60s, mostly cop shows and westerns, but also many episodes of The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. Hmm. By the late 60s, he became a favorite writer of both Don Siegel and Clint Eastwood, working with them on Stranger on the Run, Coogan's Bluff, Play Misty for Me, Dirty Harry, High Plains Drifter, Charlie Varick, The Enforcer, and Sudden Impact, and also worked as a writer or ghostwriter on The Man from Galveston, Lost Flight, The Intruders, Vanished, The Keegans, The High Country, Blue Thunder, The Sting, and Fatal Beauty. Yeah, through the 70s and 80s, he was like one of the most prominent go-to writers in terms of just coming in and doing quick polishes on scripts, and Starman seems to be like one of the few projects that he stuck with for a long time, and he was actually just really upset that he was denied a credit, and he actually kind of retired from the industry a few years later. That's sad. Oh, and the... <laughs> The only film he ever directed was a 1930s small-town romantic comedy where the entire cast were made of birds. Uh, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, like, trained birds, parrots, stuff like that, wearing little costumes and little hats in a little miniature set down. And it's otherwise, it's like an Andy Griffith-type small-town comedy where everyone just happens to be played by a bird. I want to watch that movie right now. Are you sure you hate birds? I know, but he said they were wearing hats. Oh, okay. My bad. They weren't. They were wearing hats. (laughs) All is forgiven. I completely forgot the title of it, but it's... (laughs) <laughs> I'll let you know when I look it up again, but because it, it just it looks like the most adorably weird thing. It's called pecking order. Oh snap! <laughs> Can we call it wingspan? <laughs> <laughs> to go from that to writing four dirty Harry movies <laughs> seems logical to me. <laughs> you just have to go through and erase the word bird and write man. And, same, yeah. same thing. <laughs> So anyways, John Carpenter was the sixth director attached to the project. That always bodes well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And let me let me just give you a quick rundown of, of the other ones who were attached. Mark Rydell, who was just coming off the rose, instead went on to do On Golden Pond and the River. Adrian Lynn, coming off of Foxes, went on to instead do Flashdance, Nine and a Half Weeks, Fatal Attraction, and Jacob's Ladder. Wow. John Badham, coming off Dracula and Whose Life Is It Anyways, went on to do Blue Thunder, War Games, and Short Circuit. Hmm. Tony Scott, who was still looking to break out, instead went on to debut with The Hunger and Top Gun. And Peter Hyams was coming off Capricorn 1 and Outland, and then instead went on to do The Star Chamber in 2010. Hmm. Interesting collection of people who almost made this movie, especially what's interesting about John Badham is that John Carpenter was attached to do Philadelphia Experiment for a long time, which is a story about a person who, instead of coming from space as a time traveler, on the run from the government, kidnaps a woman, they go on a road trip together, come to terms with each other, and then ultimately confront the uh, government. We'll be doing a bonus episode, because in a couple months, you two are moving. That's true. That's right. Yeah, we're out of here. Yes, and I will be doing a bonus episode on Philadelphia Experiment. But what's funny is John Carpenter left Philadelphia Experiment and did Starman, and John Badham left Starman and did Short Circuit, which is, again, a very similar story (laughs) about this inhuman being who kidnaps a woman, is on the run from the government. It's interesting that you have this weird through line Mm -hmm. between Philadelphia Experiment, Starman, and Short Circuit. It's something I'm going to bring up myself when we discuss the film. Oh, yes. (laughs) And something again I will bring up when we get to the early draft. (laughs) As mentioned, Starman had been in development at Columbia since 1979, alongside a Steven Spielberg project called Night Skies. Columbia executives ultimately decided the two projects were too similar, so they let Night Skies go, which Spielberg continued to develop at Universal until it was released in 1982 under the name E.T., To this day, Columbia executives consider it to be one of the most boneheaded decisions they ever made letting that go. I can see why it wouldn't look good on paper. (laughs) Yes. And at the time E.T. was released, that was when John Badham was signed on to direct with Kevin Bacon signed on to star. Hmm. But then E.T. came out and they're both like, nope, it's too similar. We need to go. They're smart. (laughs) So the film was executive produced by Michael Douglas, the actor. Yeah, I saw that. That was pretty cool. Yeah, he actually has a really interesting producerial career. 
films that he actually acted in as well as produced are China Syndrome, Romancing the Stone, Jewel of the Nile, Ghost in the Darkness, One Night at McCool's, and It Runs in the Family. But he's also produced a whole bunch of films that he does not appear in at all, like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Flatliners, Stone Cold, Eyes of an Angel, Double Impact, Radio Flyer, Made in America, Face Off, Face Off. <laughs> and The Rainmaker. That's a weird filmography. No, yeah, he's one of those ones like Danny DeVito. If you ever look at Danny DeVito, he's got a whole bunch of these weird it's like true, drama yeah. films yeah. that he's produced that he doesn't appear in at all. It's very smart, though, to know that you don't belong in there. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. you can't just put yourself in everything just because you like it. You can use your star power to flourish a project even if it's not a project you belong in. Exactly. It's nice. Mel Brooks does that a lot. Too. Mel Brooks produced Elephant Man. Hmm. I knew that, actually. That's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, he's got a lot of movies that he's produced. Yeah. So anyways, the actual producer-producer of the film is Carpenter's main collaborator at the time, Larry Franco, who, again, also doubled his first assistant director. This is the last of seven films in this series for co-producer Barry Bernardi, who is about to go off and do other things. The screenwriters Evans and Gideon are also credited on the film's associate producers. Finally, I just want to say, in terms of some personal stuff in Carpenter's life going on at this time, because there's so little we've ever known about what's been going on in his life at the time, but here I actually have some goodies. Mm. This is the same year, 1984, that his only child, his son John Cody Carpenter, was born. And we'll see Cody get some credits like 20 years down the road on some of his dad's films. His mother is Adrian Barbeau, and this is also the year that she and John Carpenter got divorced. <laughs> and I have no knowledge of what specifically happened, but Starman is also the first of many times we'll be seeing the name Sandy King, who is here credited as script supervisor. She will go on to become one of Carpenter's main collaborators up till today. And in 1990, John and Sandy will get married. That's nice. <laughs> Not when you, you think about in what context he's saying is that he's asking whether there's a connection between the fact that him and Adrian divorced at the same time or shortly after he met the woman that became his second wife. Yeah, and I don't want to point to accusations because you never know. Had they met before the divorce? Was he still kind of reeling from the divorce when he forged a bond with this woman who was working on set? You never know. I think we should speculate and judge. <laughs> Judgment. <laughs> I think that's like the last we're going to have about John Carpenter's personal life for a while because he is such a private person. But it's just interesting mm -hmm. that confluence of events. On I agree. Man. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Hmm. You can't yeah. hide, Johnny. <laughs> Same year his son is born, too. So you don't know how much that all factored into everything. Mm -hmm. John, we love you. We hate to speculate. We'll just leave it at that as a fact on paper. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so Starman, have either of you two seen Starman before? No. no. <laughs> really? Flat out. Okay. I feel like I have seen it in various other movies, but this actual movie now. Oh, yeah. Save it for the discussion. That's gold. <laughs> I can pepper if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Starman is one of those ones. It's been around because I know this one got a lot of play on TV. I've always known of its existence. I've yeah. always seen its box from VHS to DVD. I've always seen it on television. It I feels do. like a TV movie, not like made for TV movie, but a movie that would be on television. It does, absolutely. Yeah, like one of those movies that you would just always constantly yeah. see in syndication, yeah, which it was. Yeah. I get it mixed up with Altered States a lot. Really? I've never seen Altered States. Oh. As again, this film bombed, but it did really well on TV. I could see that. You know, I know I saw parts of it when I was a kid, when it was on TV. I believe I watched it all the way through at some point in the 90s. I want to say early 90s, mid 90s. But that was all before I really learned who Carpenter was. And so all of my associations with this and Carpenter were just in retrospect. I got like a bunch of deja vu in the beginning. So I think I must have seen it. Maybe not all the way through. Yeah. But I've definitely seen chunks of it. Because I was just like, I remembered certain scenes really yeah. clearly. Yeah. And it's again, as I pointed out with Philadelphia Experiment and Short Circuit, it's a story we've seen told. Mm -hmm. even in various other stories and formats. If there was two stories in the 80s, it would be frat party out of control and fish out of water alien type person that is evading the government. Yes. <laughs> and I should mention just a couple of things. I'm not really going to go into them in detail, but I just at least want to mention them. There was a novelization by Alan Dean Foster. I think it's actually one of his weaker books because it's just the script on paper. It's exactly huh. the script on paper. He doesn't go into it. It's very choppy. There's a couple of scenes in there that were cut out of the finished film. I'll go into them later. It's not recommended. It's just kind of a boring flat read. 
There was a comic book adaptation by DC Comics that was just two issues long. And That's it was, weird. <laughs> yeah, this was when Marvel and DC were just doing a whole ton of comic book adaptations back in the day, but they were just like squishing an entire film down in 48 pages, so they're just really rushed and choppy. They were all just like, see what sticks, let's get another Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Occasionally you get something where like, Last Starfighter, yeah, let's give that to Bill Mantlo for four issues. I'd read that. Yeah, oh, it's great. The Willow adaptation is pretty good, too. But yeah, a lot of 80s comic adaptations are just, they're squashed. They usually put their C-level teams on them. They're just, the Starman comic, I've read it, I want to say, somewhere in the mid-90s. And it was just, eh, I don't really remember much of it. And I should also mention, there was a television series, a sequel, that actually picks up with a lot of threads that we're kind of left with here at the end of this movie. Is it the wacky adventures of her as a single mother to an alien baby? Or... <laughs> Spoilers. No, it's him and his son. Him and his son. Him and his son where she's been captured by the government and they're trying to get her back. <laughs> I've only seen a few episodes back in the 90s when I played on Sci-Fi Channel, but me and my co-writer Tony will actually be covering the entire series on our blog, the Super Saturday Short Lift Showcase, as a tie-in nice. to this episode. Plug, plug, plug. <laughs> yes. Which you can find at saturdayshowcase.blogspot.com. Actually, speaking of plug, I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Xanadu Cinema Pleasure Dome, which you can find at xanaducinema.com, where they had me on for an episode discussing the entire career of John Carpenter. It was recorded back when we were on Escape from New York, so there's like chunks of the career that I hadn't gotten into yet. But it was kind of interesting just pulling back and doing a nice kind of early overview. Mm -hmm. You know, when we get to the end of this project, it'll be nice to kind of revisit that discussion with you guys just to look over that entire career as a whole. Definitely. Did you plug us on their show? Well, it's it's... Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go on a podcast to talk about John Carpenter without mentioning the John Carpenter podcast that we're on, which you can find at <laughs> mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com. <laughs> I just had to check. I had to check. Yes. Oh, why didn't I remember? <laughs> so perfect in retrospect. <laughs> that, Hindsight. You're right. That would have been a great start. I forgot to thank <laughs> my mom. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways... When an alien race recovers a Voyager space probe with its golden disk telling about Earth and inviting everyone to come visit, they send to Earth a ship with a being that we're calling the Starman to investigate. That's literally just in the credits. He's just the Starman. He's shot down by jets over the woods of Wisconsin and finds his way to the cabin home of Jenny Hayden, who's packing the place up as she mourns the death of her husband, Scott. Finding a sample of Scott's hair, the Starman rebirths himself in the man's form and kidnaps Jenny ordering her at gunpoint to drive him to a spot in Arizona within a matter of days. As they drive along, he observes and learns about human behavior and culture, and realizes how much he's hurting Jenny and sets her free. Even though she contemplates letting him go on with her car and credit card, she ultimately decides to see the mission through with him. Unfortunately, early attempts to escape have alerted authorities to their trip, and the government had already been set on high alert once the craft first appeared, with George Fox eager to tamp down a threat to national security and science advisor Mark Sherman eager to greet an extraterrestrial being. Through it all, the Starman uses his powers to save Jenny's life and impregnate her with the baby she and her husband always wanted, and she helps him get to the crater before his body deteriorates to the point of death and his comrades take off. Despite a final standoff with the military, the ship recovers the Starman and Jenny watches as it rises off. Alex, do you recommend this movie? I don't know. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's very strange for me. I went back and forth on this film multiple times. Sometimes I'm like, I don't like this at all. Sometimes I'm like, I like this a lot. Sometimes I really appreciated how weird it is. But like we were discussing earlier, there's so many 80s touchstones that it just reminded me of films that came out before and after it. I was reminded of V'ger with the satellite from Star Trek, the motion picture. Mm -hmm. I was reminded of Contact. Contact owes them a check for their beginning with like the fading out music going through a space. Yes. I was reminded of Communion. You remember Communion? Oh, that was my jam for a while. I've never <laughs> seen Communion. I've always heard of it. I'll take your word for it. I don't remember it at all. Uh, the Navigator. <laughs> remember the Navigator? Or was it Flight of the Navigator? Flight the Pee Wee Herman spaceship. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big thing that reminded me of it. The ship itself looked very similar to a ship. I can't place it, but the way it was and like the ball that came out from the middle of the triangle, that was very familiar as well. Was it those globes from the Day of the Earth Stood Still remake? It's possible. It's possible. But more to the film itself, there's mm -hmm. so many things that they could have, like if they had took a more of a less is more approach, like some of the effects, 
if they just didn't put like the glowy cartoonish effect on things, it would have been better. If they didn't have a certain sound effect, it would have been better. The performance is bizarre, yet captivating. <laughs> it's just very strange to me. I don't want to monopolize too much time. I'll discuss it more at length as we go on. But yeah, I'm really on the fence with this one. Julia, do you recommend the film? Interestingly enough, I am also on the fence, but with no emotion about it. <laughs> I guess the opposite, where I'm just kind of like, meh, yes. that was all right. <laughs> that was all right. That was okay. Yeah. I'm not, like, overly angry about stuff, which is surprising for me, <laughs> or overly uh, passionate about anything. Nothing was, like, too offensive, with the exception of that horrific sex scene, which we can talk about later. I, I would give it, like, a, a heavy C+, plus, B-. minus. I think if I was 19 again and Showcase put it on at 11 p.m., I wouldn't kick it out of bed. <laughs> you know, I'd watch it. <laughs> if I saw this when it first came out, I probably would have loved it. I'd like to point that out. There is that, too. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's aged as it well. It just before. reminds me of so many other films that I watched, and a lot of them are better. <laughs> See, and I'm going to recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> you go nuts. That's, that's absolutely fine, yeah. I've been saying for, like, a long time that I thought the thing is where he peaked. I actually think this is as good for me as the thing was. Interesting. So we have like an A, B, C situation going on? Well, I think with that recommendation, that puts it over the top because yeah. it brings us up. <laughs> What's actually interesting is that it seems like the reaction is a lot like what we had with Christine, mm -hmm. where you guys were both kind of on the fence. I mean, Alex, you leaned off and Julia, you were like, yeah, it was OK. And I'm like, oh, I love this movie. And this is a lot of the same crew that he's working with for the same studio. And I, I wonder if it just has this kind of feel to it that's just like really clicking with me. And with everyone else, you're like, it's all right, but it's not like blowing you away. But if you look back to when we first started, you've been really into this chameleonic studio version of Carpenter where he can actually adapt to the film instead of putting his stamp on everything. See, but I find that this is still also an incredibly John Carpenter movie. Interesting. In the way that it's shot, I mean, like, even though he's not doing the music, the way the music is used is still in a very Carpenter way. If you hadn't have told me that he hadn't have done the music, I would have assumed that he did. I didn't think it was him. I thought it was Tangerine Dream. It sounded like something he would do mm -hmm. to me. I find the film just beautifully shot. I think the script is great for the most part. There's a couple little hiccups here and there, specific things, like just the way certain thing is edited. But it's kind of like with the thing where, you know, the climax didn't do much for me but it still didn't tip me over to hating the movie. It's like this one where there's just a few little things, specific things that I have issues with, but for the most part, I love the actors. I love the characters. I love the journey. It is a very by-the-numbers story. It is. So, I mean, yeah, it's a very familiar story. It's a very predictable story, but I thought the actual execution of it and exploration of it just really pulled me in, and it made me happy at the end. No. And I just thought it was a very well-made film. And it's just between this and the thing, I'm just so bummed that this is not a John Carpenter that we get to see more of. Because mm -hmm. this feels like the John Carpenter who made Someone's Watching Me. Mm -hmm. This feels like the John Carpenter who was in the 70s just doing different things. Yeah, it's like a director more than a style kind of icon. <laughs> no, but see, I still find that style here. Mm. But I mean, it's just using that style in ways that's outside of what we usually expect from him. I will say that I have respect for this. I like its dreamy tone. It's sort of like the film Cloud Atlas, where I'm like, this isn't working for me, but I respect you. I've had that happen, yeah. One of the names I want to mention, this is the last time he worked with Carpenter, is the cinematographer Donald M. Morgan. For a while, I was so worried about when we'd hit the point where Dean Cundy left as John Carpenter's cinematographer because so much of John Carpenter's visual style was so tied up with Dean Cundy. But I've actually really liked his work with Donald Morgan more than I have Dean Cundy. And Morgan is the guy who shot Elvis for him mm. and then came back and did Christine and this. It's definitely more a widescreen approach to uh, Carpenter films. Like the vistas are great. There's like this kind of hazier, wistful dreaminess to it. Very much so. Aided by the score and the performances. Oh, that score. Yeah, I listened to the entire score on the CD. It's very repetitive to listen to because it's mm -hmm. just basically the same choral music over and over again. But it's very well used in the movie. Mm -hmm. It's very new agey, so it's not really my sort of thing where I like the harder edged, kind of darker synth sounds. 
Yeah, Alex said it sounded like what, like my childhood. It sounds like your childhood, very like uh, like a dire straits yeah, type yeah, of yeah. thing going on. Vangelis. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely of that '80s synth scores, mm -hmm. but there's a quality to it that I think can still work outside the '80s. Mm -hmm. That some of those '80s scores, you know, get a little bogged down in. Mm -hmm. It's very choral. There's actually not as much synth to it as you'd expect. They actually did have a choir. Oh, interesting. It is very choral, and it reminded me a lot of the score to Abyss. Yes. That kind of underwater chorus. No, oh, you're totally right there. Why don't we just go ahead and talk about the main characters first? Let's talk about the Starman played by Jeff Bridges. I couldn't take him seriously at first, but I got into it the more it went on. It seemed like he was... Uh, I don't know what he was going for. Like, it was interesting. <laughs> what I liked about him was that he was an uncertain character. Mm -hmm. In that he's not just that kind of godlike Jesus type metaphor you'd expect. No, he's bumbling. He doesn't understand what's going on. He gets angry and frustrated at times. He becomes pissy and petulant at times. He gets swept away by moments. He has emotions. He's just not used to how to express them. Yes, I like that as well, because I was waiting for that scene that happens in all these movies where he like flips through a book really fast and then knows English. So I exactly. like that he had that first stepping stone with the um, recordings that he learned from the satellite. And then he just learned as it went from there, although it did lean a little heavily on the define love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, it's hard to define love because love is the word that it is <laughs> that lost me the one line i think this was just it popped up in a rewrite somewhere because it shouldn't have been there was when they're meeting with charles martin smith in the diner i was just thinking about that i hope it's the same thing say it and he was like have you ever come to see us before and he's like yes we have visited many times it's like bullshit you guys just got the voyager probe and this is your first expedition to earth stick <laughs> with that <laughs> no, that wasn't what I had a problem with. All I could think of was when he was talking to him, so you're like an anthropologist, is like that dead face he's got where he doesn't know the word anthropologist. He just learned English two days ago. Yeah, he's just playing it yeah. cool. And he's just like, yeah, that. <laughs> There's something about that scene where it feels like it came in a later rewrite. Mm. Yeah. And I know there were a couple of other writers who, I mean, Dean Reisner did stick with the script for the most part, but there were a couple of other writers that came in and out as we went through all six of those directors. So I don't know if that is a line that came in and stuck around. But yeah, that confrontation there feels a little off. Plus, in the 80s, there was this whole thing where the alien will always talk about how great Earth is in comparison to his planet or how humans, you guys have all these emotions. You're awesome, which nowadays would be like, humans suck. <laughs> what I like is that he's got this good mix of you got some good things here. You got some bad things here. Mm. We'll come back again. You're just not ready yet. Yeah. I like a lot of the looks that he has, the verbal cues, the way that when she whistles at him, he suddenly looks around like, what is, what was that sound? <laughs> you know, or when the windshield wipers kick on mm. or that expression when he first tastes Dutch apple pie. Yeah, I like that scene. What makes an apple pie Dutch? I don't know. We'll have to look that up. It's another belly buster, whatever that thing was from the fog. <laughs> <laughs> Then you get his expression when he has an orgasm for the first time. <laughs> oh, don't oh, remind God. Thank me. Thank you for that. <laughs> I believe you had something you wanted to say about the love scene. It was disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> it was sweet and awkward. Um, no. <laughs> okay. It was gross. <laughs> Do you know what really turns me on? Hay in my butt? <laughs> Dirty? Filthy. I'll grant you that. Rail cars. Mmm. <laughs> being super cold. I love it. Hard wood plank floors. And then, you know what I love even more is having sex with like a 35 year old alien virgin who's just got no idea how to kiss. Oh, so hot. Who looks like your dead husband. <laughs> yeah, who looks like your dead husband. Who's looking that you're down from heaven being like, like, like what the. <laughs> horribly traumatized over, where it's just kind of like. No, honey, no, no. Could they have done it while they were still hiding in the mobile home? I know, right? Way better. I know. But she was, wasn't she shot in the belly? Yeah, she and was just like, recovered. He ditched her at that point. She didn't boning on her mind at that point. Like, no. she had other things to do. Yeah. yeah. It was disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. The setting aside, I thought it was just kind of sweet. <laughs> <laughs> We are not on the same page. No, we are not. <laughs> We're not riding on the same car or that train. No, I want to be in <laughs> the bar car <laughs> in the back <laughs> with some dignified upholstery. <laughs> At least some fake sheets in your fake house. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so why don't we talk about Karen Allen as Jenny Hayden? Very dreamy performance. I actually quite liked her. 
back when we were in the 70s, we were talking about, will Carpenter ever do another Lee-style character? Mm -hmm. I think this is a very good character. Yeah, no, I think she was really good. I like that. What she was doing in the beginning, where she was like drinking and remembering her husband, you Mm -hmm. don't see that very often. It's usually the other way around. And I thought that they used the whole dead husband angle very realistically in terms of, this is an incredibly traumatic thing to make her encounter her dead husband while she's still mourning his death. Mm-hmm. Which I don't think they got into it with as much detail as they would have at a later film, like film closer to today. I think they would have covered that a bit more. But yeah, I did see what they were going with. I like that that caps at the midpoint where she finally tells him Scott died and she's contemplating leaving him and catching that bus. Mm-hmm. And then she makes the choice to come and stick it out with him. But I mean, just even moments where like he puts on the hat and smiles for the first time. And just her absolute just horror at seeing that. It would mess you up big time. Yeah. But even then, I love when she's been kidnapped early on. She's messing with him in terms of, like, quietly breaking rules that he doesn't understand are being broken. You know, leaving the kidnap note. Mm -hmm. The whole, let's just pull over and yell at this guy. He's kidnapping me until he blows up a tree. (laughs) Using those balls, those uh, phantasm balls. Yeah, I really liked her character. I really liked their dynamic. Mm -hmm. It had more depth to it than you usually get in a film like this. Guys, a Dutch apple pie has a crumb top. Oh, okay, it's the crumble top. Okay. Okay, then I like Dutch apple pies. (laughs) (laughs) They are your favorite. That's true. Apple crumble pie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Back to Starman. Carry on. (laughs) Julia, do you have any thoughts on Jenny? I don't dislike I liked her. Mm -hmm. I like Karen Allen. I like Karen Allen. Mm -hmm. She's very frail. For all of that running about, she sort of looked like she just learned how to walk. (laughs) She's very small. You compared her to a newborn foal at one point. (laughs) Yeah, when she was like trying to navigate down the crater. They both were like, that was a lot of takes. Yeah, (laughs) they slipped a lot. Both her and the deer were brought to life by the (laughs) starman. There you go. There you go. Good point. (laughs) I think I liked her a lot in the beginning, and then it's not that it it went anywhere. It just didn't grow from there. Mm -hmm. I feel like her highlight was at the beginning, and then she just sort of became less a character herself and more just uh, a foil for the star man. I would agree with that. As I said, with that midpoint scene where she finally talks about the death of Scott, I think that really does complete her arc. Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. And then she just kind of is like there. I'll get you to where you need to go. Yeah. And then she's just on the run with an alien. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Even that whole thing of I've given you a baby is kind of like, okay. All right. (laughs) Yeah. I I would have been like, excuse me. Yeah. (laughs) What's weird is that, you know, you would think nowadays that that would just be them setting up a sequel. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I can find no plans for a sequel at all. So it's just interesting that they left it on that. Yeah, my uh, one note about liking a lot of other films like this better, I think, was a little premature. I think (laughs) because I was thinking about some of them and I'm like, this movie's way better than Short Circuit. I don't dislike Short Circuit. It's just it's a very different tone from this movie. Yeah, I'm doing this film a disservice by comparing it to others. That's what's interesting was I couldn't find a whole lot of information on like what each of those directors wanted to do. But basically, Dean Reiser said, you know, one of them wanted to make it just a pure thriller. One of them wanted to focus more on the military angle. Tony Scott wanted to make it more of an experimental special effects extravaganza. Hmm. You know, just throw a whole lot of weird, crazy visual effects in there. And John Carpenter was the one who's like, no, just make an old fashioned road trip romance movie like it happened one night and stuff like that. Well, he made the right call. Yeah, Tony Scott had sort of the right idea as well, uh, more than the others, but I mean, the man who fell to Earth already exists, so... Which, when did that come out? Because wasn't that... I think it was way before this, wasn't it? I feel like it There's was the There's serious 70s. clicking going on. It was 76, so that was almost a decade before, yeah. Yeah, I, I was, was going to say. say 74, so yeah. I'm amazing. There you go. <laughs> I can never remember if that film was 70s or 80s. 70s. I can't remember anything about it except Look at David a single frame Bowie's of it. genitals. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you're looking at it through the bottom of a glass. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a very apt. <laughs> It's interesting that this is a story that you could approach from so many different angles, and it has been approached from so many different angles. I don't know. I like the kind of wistful road trip thing. I love that the tension comes from just, I'm being kidnapped by my dead husband, Mm -hmm. which could have been played so poorly, but I just thought they handled beautifully. It was terrifying in the beginning when he's a baby, that effect. Oh my God. Yeah. I had forgotten about that sequence. If I was Karen Allen, I don't think I could get that out of my mind. Yeah, yeah. Like she, especially she, to like, sleep with him. Yeah, exactly. Like, remember when that was an infant on your floor? Do you no? Okay. 
still want to have sex with him on a dirty train car? Great. It's Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah, and that was just an interesting sequence. Yeah. Uh, yes, and we're doing this. Yeah. That's good, and everything's fine. All right, then. Carry yes, on. Yes, he became a kid right away. Yep. We moved on with that swiftly, so that was good. I like how there wasn't that much horror to it, but it was very eerie. It was very eerie. Like, what the fuck is going on as you're just seeing this kid? And what's fascinating is that entire sequence was done by three completely different effects studios all working together. You had Stan Winston. Huh. He did the baby. Rick Baker was bringing in a lot of the stuff that he had done in American Werewolf in terms of the stretchiness. Heavy hitters. And then Dick Smith, who did, like, Exorcist, uh, came in and did, like, the really bad shots. Wow. That's crazy. Like, that awful stop-motion shot of the face extending and stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) A lot of the effects did not work. (laughs) Yeah, the Stan Winston, Rick Baker stuff is great. Yeah, the, the original stuff, yeah. Dick Smith... I've never really been a big fan of Dick Smith. And then that kind of glowy head thing that the baby has that he also then makes his hand glow. I know that that's an effect that they then redid in Big Trouble in Little China. Mm. Yeah, but no, that was an interesting way to, to establish the character. Yeah. Literally being reborn on your floor. From the DNA, which I thought was cool, especially for the time. They didn't really get too, like, technical for that. A lot of science in, like, space science was magic back in the 80s. So I like that they actually kind of went into that. It's neat. That there was some kind of explanation. Yeah, Yeah. some kind of actual scientific explanation. (laughs) Yeah. Though I love how he looks at the picture and then a hologram of Jeff Bridges' head rises out of the photo. I'm like, you don't need to do that. (laughs) There's a picture right there. (laughs) My favorite is that they decided that the only pictures of him besides black and white baby pictures would be from the same day where they had a video, an 8x10, and two 5x7 shots of him with the hat and the shirt on. It was a great day. They it, shot guns. <laughs> they played with their hats. It was amazing. I'm like, do a shirt change, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's that easy. Time is money. <laughs> <laughs> and then they show so much of his arrival on Earth, but then we see so little of his leaving Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that part bugged me as well. That's why I was like, I was really into it because it was getting better and better. And I love little moments like when they both kiss the SETI agent and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, this is going to be great. Emotional. And it's just like, peace. Thanks for the sex. And I actually thought that that was super emotional because I I kind of took it from the regard as that he was saying goodbye to humanity and she was saying goodbye to her husband. That he allowed her the opportunity to say goodbye to him. Like, I mean, oh, she's crying. (laughs) I absolutely love that they ended on just a close up of her face as she looks up. Mm. Just because you know how obviously she was super in love with him and like she got to say goodbye. It was really nice. And it's like, we don't need to see the mothership take off. We've seen E.T. We've seen Close Encounters. We don't need to see him become a glowy ball of light again. It's just he walks off into the field and she looks up as the ship takes off. The music, the lighting, Karen Allen's face. I love that. I see your points. (laughs) And also, technically, we're also seeing him leaving from his point of view, whereas he came to Earth from his point of view. Mm -hmm. I liked that choice. But it's interesting, though, that we see so much of him born on Earth, but then his death is just walking off into the sunset. Yeah, it felt, I don't know, I I wanted more. I wanted a rainbow. (laughs) You wanted Close Encounters, didn't you? A little bit, yeah. (laughs) And going through the credits, it's ILM, so they just brought in a ton of ILM guys for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't really miss any of that. Like, I wasn't even thinking of that. I would have liked less is more. I think they shouldn't have had as many special effects as they did. I think they should have left it vague. Well, actually, I like how little effects there actually are there in the end sequence. You just have the ship appears. Mm -hmm. And then you just have that great lighting. The blue lighting on them, the red lighting in the background as snow starts whipping by. I don't know. I just really like that image. No, I like that. It looked good. It's not about the spaceship. It's not about the military. It's about them saying goodbye. Yeah. I just would have cut the ship out completely. I would have had the light and everything and just have him kind of... I don't mind seeing the globe. I thought it was really cool when it was first coming down because it looked like a fertilized egg. Mm -hmm. Like a human... What are they called? Zygotes? Yeah, zygote sounds about right. Yeah. It looked like that, which I thought was really cool. So the zygote comes down, enters the womb of Earth, says, nope. I'll come back later. I'm just going to take this guy home. We'll be back. We left a little something for you. Yep. Have fun raising it. (laughs) Death, rebirth, and birth. These are the themes, guys. We nailed it. Yeah. High five. Dutch apple pie. Woo, crumble top. (laughs) It's interesting that they do those set up the whole threads. It's not only I made you a baby, but he will know everything I know. He will become a teacher. Give him this glowy ball someday. It's like (laughs) you are setting up a sequel, and yet you aren't, and it's weird. 
It is. And then we get a TV series which picks up on those threads entirely, where it's the teenage boy, knows everything he knows, has a ball. You know, the dad comes back, teams up with him as they're trying to get the mom back. It's like, okay. These are just little eggs for future screenwriters. Yeah, speaking of little eggs, all those little silver balls. Yeah. I like that he has a finite amount and that he burns through so many of them in the first half of the movie. Well, that kind of irritated me where I'm just like, don't blow up trees if you can make people come back to life with those yeah, things. Yeah, conserve your energy, guy. But I like that because it's a realistic detail where he takes them for granted, but then things start to get really serious and he's like, shit, I only have a few left. Well, I mean, I agree with you completely. It's just yeah. that it's still frustrating because realism is frustrating. Yeah. And I like, though, that they're making use of that it's limited. But yeah, mm-hmm. no, I, I agree. I get you. Yeah, why don't we talk about some of his encounters as a human, like going to the men's room. Yeah, that was great. I love that it could have been just a very bad homophobic joke, Mm -hmm. but it was done in just the right way. Yeah, no, it was just like, this guy's weird. There's no real indication either way. For an 80s movie, thank you for not taking the cautious route. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for your restraint, 1984. (laughs) (laughs) And I love how it's like, even as she's talking to the teller, he feels the need that he has to add gas. (laughs) There was the usual tough guy, hunter guy, like the one Mm -hmm. guy in Superman 2, who's just so aggro, it's crazy. It's just immediately, like, slapping him in the face and wants to fight and won't even let it go. Like, she pulls out a gun and fires it in the air, and all they do is walk over, like, ten feet away to reconvene. Yeah, but I also like that because it felt like a realistic gunfire in the air. Not everyone's going to scatter. Most people are just going to be like, "Uh, what's going on? That's true. What's the situation (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm sure it's the the state as well. They're just like, ah, we're used to this. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, because they all have guns. It's true. So they're just kind of waiting to get to their guns. Yeah. Yeah. Because you saw him lock his shotgun up in his trunk. Right. And I should point out that that is Ted White, who was a stuntman and actor going back to the 1940s. And Carpenter really loved working with him because he was a stuntman on a bunch of Howard Hawks' movies back in the day. And Howard Hawks is one of Carpenter's favorite directors. Mm Mm-hmm. He was also a stuntman on Escape from New York, and he played Jason Voorhees in Friday the 13th Part 4. The best Ooh, one. Ooh, the best one. Mm-hmm. Cool. I like the hunter scene. I don't get why when he's so absorbed with Dutch apple pie, he would then go out to do the deer instead of waiting. Yeah, he had a very single-minded focus on that deer. I like a lot of the construction of that scene with, you know, the bus. Do I leave him? Do I not? Mm -hmm. Trying to make sure he knows everything he needs to know. I really liked the waitress in that scene. She was great. Yeah, she was great. Yeah, she was a secretly. I even took a wedge myself. (laughs) Yeah. I've seen her in a bunch of stuff. Oh, yeah, she's been around as an actress. She's got a lot of zazz she brings to the role. There's a lot of actors in this, like the guy in the men's room. You see him play a biker to this day in a lot of stuff. (laughs) The two cops who were going after him, one of them was one of the main actors on Lost for a few years, and one of them is currently on Brooklyn Nine. Uh, Is it Brooklyn Nine Nine? I think it's Brooklyn Nine Nine. Yeah, is he one of the uh, older detectives? Yeah, that makes sense. The main military guy is Richard Jekyll, who was one of the major character actors of the 60s and 70s and was in, like, almost every film by Robert Aldrich. Hmm. Like, Dirty Dozen, Longest Yard, Too Late to Hear, all stuff like that. Cool. But yeah, no, it's interesting. Just all these small parts of all these actors who then went on to all these major things. Mm-hmm. Then you have, like, the cop scene, where the cops are just, like, whipping out a shotgun and, as we've learned today, not a very inaccurate portrayal of cops. Yeah. <laughs> I like that people will help them away from the cops. I love that that one mustache dude comes up and he's just like, I don't know what's going on, man, but they're at your car. Yeah, he was great. (laughs) I'm like, party on, mustache guy. (laughs) That was a bit of an edit that bothered me at first, but I kind of liked just the randomness of it. Mm -hmm. It was that before they went into the hotel room, that guy was fussing with a vending machine that had eaten his money and, you know, the star man, you know, touched it and it spit out a whole bunch of candy and sodas and stuff. I don't, I think I missed that. Yeah. Well, it does make sense because how did he know what? What room they were in. That's true. And then exactly. it was their car. It's candy bar guy. And then that's why the distraction is throwing over that vending machine. Yeah, that makes sense. It's still an amusing scene. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the only other real editing bits I had a problem with were while they're on the back of the truck talking with the baby, there's just this very visible and random dissolve cutting over a bunch of dialogue. Hmm. Then the bit where they plow their car into the tanker truck and he saves her from it. It's like they don't even hold for a beat before he comes out. It's like, nope, just instantly walking out. 
Yeah, I didn't. That part didn't ring very well with me, and yeah. I think they could have done without the work. glowing effect. Yeah, just have them walk into the fire. It's more shocking. I mean, those are like my only real little quibbles with the movie. Mm-hmm. I even love the bit where she's trying to track him down again after he leaves her, and she just gets this young guy in his hot rod. Yeah, that guy was awesome too. There was a lot of cool people they met on the road. <laughs> even the whole bit of "I need your help to distract from the police." Sure, I'll make a Molotov cocktail out of my gas tank. <laughs> Yeah, he was really down to help. That guy was waiting for someone to come into that truck stop for years. Yeah, he's like, I need an adventure. I need it now. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> My day has come. <laughs> Anything else either of you would like to bring up? Uh, let me just consult the old notes. Put on your cheaters, dear. Yeah. <laughs> I will say the cook who he bums a ride with, the guy who gives him the cigarette, Mm -hmm. that's George Buckflower, who we've seen before. He was one of the fishermen in the fog. He was a drunk guy and escaped from New York. We are going to see him again in like five other Carpenter films. He's also the drunk guy on the bench in all the Back to the Future movies. Amazing. Oh, and Joe Alves, who was the production designer on Escape from New York, he was the second unit director of this movie. Because he really wanted to direct and Jaws 3D did not work very well (laughs) in terms of directing. And him and Carpenter actually did also work on a number of other things that just never got made. Like, I will at some point be doing a piece on John Carpenter's The Ninja. Oh, my God. Which never ultimately got made, but him and Joe Alves worked together on for a year scouting locations for. Any other notes that either of you have to bring up? Nope. I think my only main notes were their budget seemed to go mostly towards explosions and helicopters. Yeah, boy, when the helicopters come. Yeah, that's They great. go all out. Yeah. <laughs> Very uh, apocalypse now. The first thing I thought was just like, all the helicopters came, and I'm like, well, that seems a bit exorbitant. And then we had to watch the helicopters come for like a solid three minutes, and I'm like, well, they had to make their money's worth. Like, they got all those helicopters. We need to see 20 different shots of these helicopters showing up. And it's also a lot of shots of John Carpenter flying a helicopter. He was having fun. (laughs) There you go. My sore point with that is that all these helicopters show up and are chasing them around the cauldron of the, the crater, shooting at them, firing missiles. And then the mothership shows up and the military just stops. Yeah. Well, I mean, what can you do at this point? The ship is so gargantuan and shaped like a planet. Yeah, but it's like we never get like anything to happen that just explains why. Yeah, I thought they were nav systems would shut down or something or like things would stop working. But no, I think they were just in awe of a little moon coming down. Yeah. To like just shot out some little lightning bolts that just kind of scared the helicopters away or something. Yeah. yeah. I like that they had that whole opening sequence where Norad saw the tiny meteor come down and knew exactly that it was in Washington or wherever it was that it landed down and found her house and found him. But this planet sized ship arriving, no prior knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> what the? <laughs> what? Where did that come from? <laughs> well, it literally just came right down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> If you're outside the atmosphere, you're not going to show up on radar. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, there it is. All right, then. We just needed a shot of one person slowly lowering their sunglasses looking up <laughs> at it. <laughs> I love the one scientist in the wheelchair when they're talking about how is it that he looks like this? Uh, well, we think it's a cloning type deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was great. That was like in the first Fantastic Four movie where they're like, yeah, that, what about that crazy energy burst? What was up with that? <laughs> I like the odd little group of people around Sherman. Like, you have that scientist, you have the one guy who was at the uh, landing of the ship who's drilling into it, and they're like, what are you doing? Well, you never told me not to. (laughs) And then uh, back to the guy in the wheelchair, we saw two movies in a row with a random scientist in a wheelchair for no reason. We were like, good on you, movie. Yeah, good job. Yeah. What was the other one? Uh, I think it was Spider-Man. Yeah, it was Spider-Man. Yeah, there's just a good dude in a wheelchair. We're like, you don't see that that often. It's great. Yeah. I also really like the black helicopter pilot who just kept popping up. Why? With his helmet on all the time. He's always with his helmet on. I'm like, how can you hear anything, buddy? Yeah. Tony Edwards played Sergeant Lemon. We noticed him. Yeah, yeah. we're just yeah. like, we like you. Yeah. No, and I like that that's like a typical character who would just be in one scene, but then he keeps showing up again yeah. and again and again. He's your liaison. Mm-hmm. And built a really nice rapport. Like, I even love the whole thing of, uh, are you listening to the police channels? Tell me if you hear anything weird. Like what? <laughs> anything weird. <laughs> and then when he gives him the report later, he's like, what's this about? It's something weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's another way we haven't talked about. Charles Martin Smith is Sherman. Yeah, he was good. I've seen him before. Like, I've seen him multiple times before. He was one of the main characters of American Graffiti. That yeah, would make sense. The I old see George that. Lucas movie, yeah, uh, yeah. Never Cry Wolf. He's been around. He's still around. He directs a lot of TV now, too. He actually did the two Dolphin Tail movies. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That have come out recently. We know those. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, oh, he directed Airbud. Amazing. The original Airbud. The original Airbud. He works the original with Airbud as well. <laughs> Canadian, Canadian guys. <laughs> Canadian franchise. There's very few. Okay. Yeah, it was bought by Disney, right? Wasn't everything. You were bought by Disney recently. I, I know I got my check. You didn't get yours. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. I was very weird. sad about that. <laughs> you lot are Canadian, so you're probably more familiar with Da Vinci's Inquest than we are. We're very familiar with Da Vinci's Inquest. Yeah. He's been on it. He's directed for it. Yeah. There you go. I like the, you know, it's very typical, the whole, you know, the scientist is like, we need to save the alien. The military is like, we need to stop the alien. I was thinking that, too, about how many American-made movies, pretty much the majority of them that I can think of anyways, always involve the American government shooting first and asking questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's always about an everyman struggling against the government to try and save whatever the alien is bringing or the alien itself or trying to do. Yeah. Occasionally a civil servant like in this will yeah. be on their side. Yeah. <laughs> but it's always about the... Bureaucracy? <laughs> Boy, I love how he got all that play out of the cigar. Oh my god, that was so lame. I was like, <laughs> as soon as he pulled him out, I'm like, why the F are you pulling out a fucking cigar right now, Rando? And then I'm like, oh, it's a thing. Because as soon as he didn't light it, I'm like, ugh. <laughs> and then it became a thing where he like kept pulling it out and didn't light it. I'm like, is he going to light it up at the end? And of course he did. It was just very like old school theater to me. I was just kind of like, ugh. And I just <laughs> imagined like the prop person endlessly having to provide him with this effing cigar where it's like his thing and then like losing it. It and trying to find the exact same one in a cigarette store in Arizona because he needs it. And, you know, it's part of his character. No one gives a shit. <laughs> I never know what's going to make her mad. <laughs> And I will say, the whole cigar thing is in, like, every draft of the script. Oh, oh, is it right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, really? This is the part of this character that's stuck to the end. Oh, it's <laughs> lame sauce. I don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> I do like the whole thing, though, where after he meets him in the diner, he lets them go, and he's like, oh, wrong couple, huh? Yeah, the guy we're looking for is older. Yeah. Would it have been better or worse if at the very end he goes to light the cigar finally, and then the match blows out? I don't care. That's the whole point. <laughs> it's stupid. All right, I'll write my own cigar <laughs> material. Don't care about your stupid hand action. like <laughs> Especially when he's already got Jeff Bridges lighting up his lips. Yeah, your, right. your business is of no interest to me, sir. <laughs> Would you like it better if he had a coffee cup in his hand? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I actually love that in a 1980s John Carpenter movie, we have a tender, non-judgmental man-on-man kiss. Yeah, it was nice. That was wonderful. Yeah, I like that a lot. That mm -hmm. gave it like 20 points. And I like how he's just kind of like, okay, he just did that. And then you just have that one southern lawman in the background just being like, what yeah. are these northerners doing? Yeah, I don't approve. No, <laughs> don't care for it. But what I like is that it's portrayed in a way that's just as judgmental on that character. Oh, yeah, for sure. As opposed to just judging the scene. <laughs> yeah. Well, these guys are all not in our good books from the get-go. <laughs> but I love that everyone just presumes he's European. That's true. I'm trying to think of any other moments. It is a very light story, so there's not a whole lot of depth to get into with it. Except for the whole dead husband thing, but we already did that. Yeah. Yeah, I already cried, so yeah. we're good. <laughs> I'm good on my end. I think I got everything I wanted to say. Yeah, I think I'm good. I think we got a lot of material. I, I will go on record as saying I've been swayed, and I'm going into recommend. Not nearly as strong as you, but I'm going with recommend. So we'll go with that for your final thoughts. Julie, any final thoughts? I think if this was a made-for-TV movie, it would be amazing. See, for me, though, then you'd lose that great widescreen photography. But then it would be amazing. No, like I just mean like if it was judged on that level or if it was like a series, like a television series or something like that. A lot of beefing up and stuff, but that would be great. I still give it a solid B plus, but, okay. uh, but talking about it has really brought up some really great moments that I really did enjoy. And of course, the fact that the last scene did make me cry has got to mean something, right? Oh. There you go. Emotions. Extra credit. Yeah. And I still stand by, I do think it's like Christine in that it has flaws and it obviously it doesn't connect with everyone in the same way it does with me. But this is one of my favorites of this stretch of his career. Might even make it into my top five Carpenter movies by the time we get to the end. We'll see. That's awesome. I really enjoyed this movie. And it was, again, this is one I hadn't seen probably early 90s. Even I had never watched this movie as a Carpenter movie before. Mm -hmm. I never had. This was really a nice experience. I know I've definitely seen that deer scene before. 
Yeah. It's so laid back and it's almost episodic where it's like builds up to another beat of like a diner or something. I could see it working well on television. I mean, it'd be great for TV. You know, I just thought because that's the midpoint of the movie, if you're ever flipping through channels and coming across this, that would be the scene that's probably around at the top of the hour. Yep. Yeah. So as soon as like another show ended, you'd be flipping through channels and then that's probably the scene you'd come in on. What's that guy doing to that deer? <laughs> I actually really like that we talked about it in The Thing, where those shots where you would have, like, Julie, I think you mentioned them, the corridor shots where you'd have the yep. camera, like, doing someone's point of view, and then you would cut to the opposite. I mm-hmm. like how we kind of get that following the deer sequence where the guys are rushing out of the bar towards him, mm-hmm. and you just get that POV shot rushing into his chest then cuts him getting tackled. Yeah, that was really good. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but otherwise, I think that's all I've got to say about the movie. And if you just got a few minutes for me to just tell you a few things about the original draft. Oh, yeah, sure. Go right ahead. <laughs> The original draft was, it was much more short circuit. It was much goofier. It was played a lot less straight. So basically the opening of the original draft is the opening of E.T., where the ship comes down and all the occupants come out and it's like in the woods on the outskirts of the suburbs and they're like getting little plant and animal samples. And then the police come in, start shooting at them. They kill one of them. The ship is forced to take off. Starman gets stranded. And in this one, the Starman is... He is humanoid. He's got like translucent skin and he's wearing a neon green spacesuit with rocket gloves. <laughs> like literally his gloves have jetpacks on them that he can like jump around like the Incredible Hulk. Iron Man. <laughs> it's not very good. I still kind of want to see it. <laughs> the script kind of sucked. The script was very much more like an 80s movie, a typical 80s movie, which will probably mean that it would be more interesting for some people. It wasn't for me. You still have the basic plot of he takes on the appearance of her dead husband, he kidnaps her, they go on the road trip. In this one, though, it's like he uses one of those little glowing balls as almost like a dot matrix printer, as it's literally like etching in the appearance of the husband on him. But again, you know, Tron kind of came out and did that exact same effect already, Mm -hmm. so they couldn't use that. They make it more explicitly clear that while their technology is a little more advanced, they're not that different from us. And this was actually their first time going to another planet. So he's just as weirded out by us as we are them. Instead of the deer scene, you have a scene in a mall where she's kind of ditched him and he's just wandering on his own through the mall. And he comes across a baby carriage where he just walks over and picks up and starts to inspect the baby. Mm. So the mom comes running out going, what the fuck are you doing to my baby? And a whole bunch of guys start swarming him and saying, don't you dare touch this baby and trying to steal this baby and start beating him up for that. And then that's when Jenny comes back and just tells everyone he's retarded. And then that, instead of he doesn't know English, becomes the go-to phrase throughout the movie. Don't mind him, he's retarded. Oh, 1980s. Yes. Well, they made the right call. (laughs) Yes. Also, Sherman, in this version, is the military guy who just wants to kill the Starman hmm. and wants to take him out. And there is no other character. It's just Sherman and like his assistant. And there is no counterpoint to him. He is just always after them, always trying to kill them. And the Starman actually kills like 30 people over the course of the movie. Whoa. Yeah, no, guy, leading up to the big climax, because the Starman is himself now paranoid of cops. Because cops killed his best friend in the beginning scene of the movie. Mm -hmm. So there's a point where the Starman buys a toy ray gun from a store and rigs it up as an actual death ray gun. So, I mean, he is literally like vaporizing police cars as they're chasing after him. In the big end scene in the crater, as Sherman and his attack helicopters are coming in, he's literally blowing helicopters out of the sky. But he's fueling it on those little silver bolts, so he runs out. So you have the big final thing where Sherman and his Apache are about to take him out with missiles when the mothership comes down and blows up Sherman in the helicopter. This movie sounds amazing. <laughs> it's it's amazing in just how completely different it is, despite the fact that the basic story is exactly the same. It even has the whole thing of, you know, getting her pregnant with the son. Mm. But it's like played in such a completely different style. If I was to assemble a bunch of 80s tropes, I would come up with what you described more than what I came up with Starman. See, and that's the thing is Starman, I want to say, is a very timeless movie. I mean, it's very much a movie made in the 80s, but there's a lot to it that ages well. Oh, yeah. 
And that also, I think, would have spoken to audiences even before the 80s. It's, there's a very timeless quality to Starman. Mm-hmm. Just the way that Jenny Hayden speaks is very timeless, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's very much in the 80s, but it's also, you know, that kind of rural aspect where that's the same kind of plaid shirts and jeans that people have been wearing for 40 years. Oh, yeah. You know, still to this day. All her looks are 100% back in style now, yeah. including the leather jacket and everything. I mean, and as I said, you know, the 80s synth score is played in a way that it doesn't feel as 80s uses a lot of other synth scores. Mm-hmm. I mean, a few effect shots aside, this is a film that I think ages very well, but that script, that script would have been pure early 80s. Oh, yeah. And would not have held up well. It's like my science project type of thing, you know? I was going to say it would have a name like the Alienator or something like that. Oh, and then, you know, the movie had that one weird moment where he was like contacting the mothership and it does his little subtitles, emergency transmission. Yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> In the original script, he's literally like on a two-way radio with the other ship all the time. And you get these subtitles of like, oh, yeah, some barbarian savage woman. You know, I managed to kidnap her. I'm going to make her take her to this place, you know? They got these things called guns. They remind me of the guns that we got, you know, and he's like having entire conversations about how stupid everyone on Earth is. And it's like, come on, you guys got to get me out of here. They do have Skittles and rock music. It's radical. (laughs) And it's like the entire script is him being an asshole and her calling him retarded. (laughs) Oh, man. And it's not a surprise that these are the writers who then went on to do Cuffs and Jungle to Jungle. Yeah. You know? (laughs) Both, I think, are in Roger Ebert's I Hated, Hated, Hated This <laughs> <Yes>. Movie Book. <laughs> yes. And it's like, I think the only reason Stand By Me is so good is because they had a good book that they're adapting. Yeah. You know? But yeah, I mean, Jungle to Jungle says everything you need to know about what these writers are like. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't hate Jungle to Jungle, but it's not Starman. <laughs> no. So, and then that's really all I had to say on that early draft. So, I think that brings our episode to a close. I believe so as well. I think we've said all we can say about Starman. We wish him well. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Three, two, go. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. My name is Alex. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, I might actually need to press record before you do that. Oh, oh. Julie. You know what? At least I, I remember I it actually, right now. You know yeah. what? I need to as well. Right, hey. <laughs> We're all professionals here. Yes. Right. Take a little sorry extra time that, to prepare. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> Okay, you're good. <laughs> Make sure, yep. I'm uh, recording both the call and my side, so. <laughs> Excellent. I don't know if it holds up. I, it scared the hell out of me when I was young, but Aliens did. Yeah, that was a, a movie book combo for me, man. Oh, I really? Yeah. Oh, oh I had my period where I was terrified of Grays, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Grays, yeah. yeah. Fire in the Sky, shit. It's making sense. Uh, I actually read a really terrible book that was from the perspective of a gray alien working in the American government. <laughs> Oh, Julia. <laughs> so many layers to your onion. It was like a, the picture of his face with like an American flag behind it. That sounds amazing. Oh, Not a pot oh. leaf. <laughs> Brother no Termite? It. What was Brother it called? Termite by Patricia Anthony. Mm. Yeah, I did read that. Was it? You yeah. two read all the same books when you were kids. I've never read it. It's just been sitting on my shelf for the last decade. I've never That's read it. so strange. <laughs> if you want a sweet B-plus ride. <laughs> <laughs> Back wow. on topic. He really describes in detail his eyesight. His peripheral vision is amazing. Between that and the My Girl novelization. Which I also read. There you go. We need to start a book club. That's right. There you go. Got this on lock. (laughs) Sorry, Ali. Sorry. I liked Gremlins 2 novelization. (laughs) Um, It sucked compared to the George Gape novelization of the first. I'm sorry. (laughs) 